Uh, all right. Uh, so if you'll turn to Joshua chapter seven, um, for the sake of getting your notes up to speed, we certainly, we stopped last week. I put a little asterisk. Tell me if I'm right uh, at verse 10, um, which was also uh, number seven on your outline. Um, but just to very quickly uh, go through that, um, starting uh, uh, on your outline where it says defeat at Ai in the sin of Achan, or the Hebrew is Achan, I love to say that. Um, that number four is the disobedience of Israel's defined. The disobedience of Israel is defined. Um, and um, we saw, if you remember, uh, that previous to this, the, um, the Israelites, as they're going in to take the land, uh, they had just had this great, great victory. Uh, where? Where did they have this great victory? At Jericho, right? They did their thing. They did exactly what God had said. And for seven days, they did the specific things that God said to be do, which was totally uh, not part of a, a, your standard traditional um, military plan. But God doesn't work that way anyway. And they did something that was totally different. Uh, and you can imagine, we talked about how the, uh, the folks of Jericho, these wicked, wicked people, by the way, uh, would have been thinking about, you know, they locked themselves in and they nobody could go in or out. They saw these things and then they're wondering why in the world these people are going around and carrying this, this golden box and with people with horns uh, and, and just walking around one time, blowing the horn continually. And I, I will, I will, I will uh, uh, spare you my illustration from last week of how honking can be very, very, uh, uh, make you bonkers, um, but that's what it was like. And then on the seventh day, they walked around seven days or seven times, blew the horns the whole time, heard the thing, and then the people after the after that, uh, they were supposed to do what? And the walls would come tumbling down. They were to shout, and then after they shouted, they fell straight down, uh, and they were able to go in and, and to take care of all that. So if you look there at uh, that's they had this great victory. But there was a problem because God was very specific as to what they were to do afterwards. And what was that? All right. They were supposed to kill everything with the exception of a few things that they were allowed to take and to put into. They were to, to use it for the Lord's work uh, and, uh, in, uh, in, and for his um, uh, use and so forth. Not that God needed it. That's ridiculous to think that. But God is very clear on what he wanted them to do. And every single one of them were so incredibly obedient to do that, weren't they? Almost, right? There's at least one dude who chose not to, and God was not happy about it. And in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took some of the devoted things and the anger of the Lord burned against who? Against all of Israel. All right. And so that set the stage for last week. It's interesting too. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's interesting that the word of God doesn't just say Achan. What do you observe in verse one that God also has recorded for us in his word about Achan. He has his, his family. So it, it, it makes you think, well, is it, what's God's purpose there? Was it, was it just for record's sake on who this is the Achan we're talking about? Or was it possibly, and I don't want to read too much into scripture, but it makes you wonder if, if there was an element of, of his disobedience may have just been the result of, of family dysfunction. Who knows, right? Uh, it's interesting, too, that, you know, the, over and over again, we see in the Old and New Testament, a lot of times these mentioning of names about things are used for good and for bad. So, because not everybody gives all that detail. All right, so just a side note. So, um, uh, so in verses two through five on your outline, 
was the defeat at AI was described uh, in chapter two, verse uh, seven, verse two through five. And so basically, if you remember what happened, they basically just said, you know what? We just defeated um, Jericho. We had this great victory. They sent spies out and they saw that uh, AI was this much, much smaller uh, city, uh, nothing compared to Jericho. Uh, and so they, they came back with the report and they said, you know, this isn't all that big of a deal. You know, we just had this great thing at Jericho and there's not as many people. Why don't we just take a few people and uh, we'll, we should be able to conquer this city. Because by the way, it was the next kind of in line getting, coming continually into the promised land. Um, and what happened? They failed, right? Uh, they lost some people and the, uh, 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 would you call them AIans? Anyway, the, the people of AI, the, the men of valor, the warriors chased them. And so here was uh, um, Joshua, completely confused, going, God, why in the world did you let this happen? And that's found on your number six on your outline where it says it's the dismay of Joshua's depicted in verses six through nine. In other words, he's in despair. He's wondering what in the world basically just happened. Let's look there as we set the stage as we go into our, the rest of our study tonight. So if you look in chapter seven, verse six, starting there, after, uh, as, as a matter of fact, it says right in verse five, it says, and the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as uh, Shabaram and struck them at the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became as, as water. Because, I mean, they're like, oh, what? what just happened here? Why, why would you allow us to have this, this big victory, God? And then now we're losing people. And we're, we're at shame here. Well, look in verse 6 there. Joshua has the same response. It says, then Joshua tore his clothes, which is, of course, a typical uh, Jewish way of showing um, uh, remorse and, and sorrow. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. So the invitation is there. He was there for a long time. He and the elders of Israel. So he wasn't alone. All the leadership were there. And they put dust on their heads. Good. Again, another way of them showing remorse and so forth. Um, verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought all this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? In other words, the Amorites were another people name for this city of Ai. And to destroy us. Uh, he says, What that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So he's perplexed. He's like, why did this just happen, God? Why would you do this? So clearly he's having a little bit of a pity party. But secondly, he's also uh, is jealous for God because he's going, you know, the word's going to get out really quick. First of all, we had this great victory, which clearly the word had gotten out before and made people fearful. Well, you know, as soon as the word gets out, it's like, look, here's the strategy. Just get a bunch of people to chase them down or whatever they did. And they were able to overcome them and kill some of them. That word would get out very, very quickly. And it would, it would bolster, if you will, the, the, the energy and the confidence in the enemy uh, and so they're at risk. And so Joshua here is just perplexed and he's trying to figure out why would God allow this to do? Well, so now we come to the next part of your outline in verses 10 through 15. And that is the direction from God delineated. The direction from God delineated in verses 10 through 15. First of all, in verses 10 through 12, we have... The directions given to Joshua by God. Let's look here. And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. 
Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. So now Joshua is getting a little bit of a picture then. Okay, somebody clearly has disobeyed the instructions that were given. The instructions were the devoted things were to be devoted to God and him only. Everything else, no spoils, everything was to be taken care of. But there's sin in the camp. And we talked about last week, you know, it's, it's amazing here how God is holding the whole nation, the whole nation accountable for the action of this one person. And, and, and it really is quite humbling if you think about the holiness of God through all of this that takes sin that serious. Now, thankfully, God also gives a lot of grace most of the time. Amen. But God here in his wisdom, as we're going to see, is right on to be able to set the precedence going forward. And I don't think, I don't think God would say this, but it's kind of like, don't mess with me. You know, don't, don't mess with me. So the directions to Joshua is getting, and, and, and specifically in verses 11, he shares that the, the, the cause of Israel's failure. There's sin in the camp. Somebody has taken of, of the devoted things, uh, and I'm not going to do anything else until you handle this. And then the consequences there are just that in verse 12. I, in other words, you're not going to be able to stand against the enemies. And so in verses 13 through 15, here's the directions that the Lord gives to the people. Look here in verse 13 through 15. So he says it again, get up. Now, I do want to, I do want to just talk briefly about this. I don't want to sleep and dwell on it too much, but I want you to think about Joshua's response and God's response. Now, God knew Joshua's heart. Joshua is perplexed. He is wondering, he's going to his God, wondering what's happening. But God is basically just telling him, you know what? There are times that you need to be this and there are times that you need to act. This is one of those times that I need you to act. I'm giving you instructions. Here's what you need to do. Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 13, he says it again. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord shall take come near by household, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near by man, and he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, <laughs> he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Could you imagine hearing that? Now, keep in mind, there were over a million people. Uh, and if you were the one, Achan, uh, you're maybe thinking, maybe I just won't get caught. But you think about God's methodology here to, to point out. Now, we don't know. But there's, there is a possibility, because as we read here and we see what happens, that maybe if Achan right up front would have confessed, there's the possibility that God would have had grace. I don't know that, but once we go through here, we're going to see how long that it went before. In fact, he never confessed until they went to his tent, until Joshua gets in his face and says, my son, tell me, we'll see that here in just a moment. But the directions there for the people, and they're thinking, what would be your first thought? All right. So in other words, God says, you just lost. 
I'm not going to be with you. I'm not going to help you at all because there's sin in the camp. Somebody is devoted. What would be the first thing in your mind that you would go to? Um, do what? Well, let's go find that clown. But, but also, what would be the first thing that would probably run is like, I didn't do it. I know I didn't do it. So why am I being held accountable for this? But then you probably would go home and start asking your, your family, if you did this, I will kill you before God does, you know, or whatever that conversation would be like. So you can imagine this process that they're, they're thinking through uh, their mind. So that's the direction that God has. God's told Joshua, there's a problem. I want you to tell the people, this is what we're going to do. And if you remember the very, very first thing he tells them before the instructions on how they're going to do this the next morning, what do you see? They're going, they're supposed to do what? Consecrate yourself again. Because if you remember before, they had just gone through that. So, hmm, all right, consecrate yourself, get your heart prepared for all of this. I think that might have been even another plea to Achan, who knows? But then in verses 16 through 21, the next thing on your outline is the discovery of Achan is described. So in verses 16 through 18, we see the search for the guilty party. And now, again, Think about how this was done. So Joshua rose early in the morning, which is appropriate because there's a lot of people to go through. And he would also have his leadership and so forth working through all of this. Now, the question arises is that how did they know? In other words, as they went through, what did they use to be able to determine? Was it God lighting their heads? Was it God um, just telling the leadership okay, this family's good, this clan's good. There are some that believe that it's possible that it could have been the use of the Urim and the Thummim. How many here has ever heard of the Urim and the Thummim? I love that term because it sounds like I'm with you. All right. Um, that is your homework. If you haven't, if you don't remember what the Urim and the Thummim, U-R-I-M, and then the second word is Thummim, T-H-U-M-M, -M, Mama Mama, I, N as in Nancy, or November, all right? Um, and so uh, the Urim and the Thummim was a way, supernaturally, that God was able to also to discern his will. So for those of you all that don't know what that is, you're going to have fun looking up the Urim and the Thummim and what that is. But it's possible that they use that. We don't know, all right? But I, it's somehow, some way, God was able to reveal to them who the guilty person was. All right, so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe. He brought them near tribe by tribe. So, you know, they had these 12 tribes and, you know, did they all like kind of shift and he kind of looks at them and God goes, nope, that's not them. Don't know, somehow, but they came tribe by tribe. Um, and the tribe of who was taken? Judah. Now, why does Judah sound familiar? Judah, Judah, Judah. No, no, wrong thing. Why does Judah? How does Judah? Why does Judah? What's the line? Who's the line of Judah? Jesus, right? So it is that tribe, not reading into it, but there's problems even in the tribe is my point. The tribe of Judah was chosen. So that eliminates how many? 11. Thank you very much. That eliminates the other 11 tribes. And you can imagine they all went back to their tents going, Shoo, right? We know it's not us. So by the way, in numbers, yeah, in numbers, you can go back and look at the numbers of people in the tribes, thousands, right? And that's just men. All right. So he brought the near the clans of then uh, verse 17, and he brought near the clans of Judah. The clans are subunits within tribes, all right? So he brought the clans of Judah, and specifically the clan of the Zerahites was taken. So we've got tribe, clan, 
and then he brought near the clan of the Zerahites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. So in other words, the man by man of the families within the uh, clans. And then he brought, that's the big family. And then verse 18, he brought near his household, man by man. So it's dwindling down. Thousands, then hundreds, then tens. And then here we go into the family of Achan. This would have taken some time. That's why Joshua, I'm sure, woke up early in the morning. Says, I want to get this taken care of. And it's going to take a while. And Achan, the son, here we go again. It's mentioned, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. So pretty interesting. And then in verses 19 through 21, we see some lessons from Achan's sin. It says in verse 19, and then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. You know, human nature would, would have to make you think of how would I respond in that? In other words, clearly, Achan is probably wondering, how in the world did this dwindle down to me? But he's seen the miracles of God. But he was probably hoping that somehow, some way, I'm not going to get found out. But he hid this thing. And so he finally confesses, as we'll see here in a moment, and tells him where it is. <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but I can't help but think that I would lie. I, I, I would just say, wasn't me. Not, no, was, wasn't me. And then the other side of me would go, well, God's already dwindled it down this far. But maybe if I do finally confess it this time, I'll get off the hook. So that's possibly what he was thinking. Because if he knew what's getting ready to happen to him and his whole family, was, I would have lied. Was Joshua the only one given the instructions of what to do back in verse 15? The, well, he is the one. Um, the, whole camp, the whole camp knows it. Yeah. So in other words, because he instructed, the, wow. the, this is what's going to happen. Wow. All right. So that's the point. Okay. Because... The, you know, you see it. That's what I'm saying is, is that when you saw this process happening, you can't, you'd like to think it's like, all right, let me just confess. I can see where this is going. But he got to the point to where he was quiet the whole time. And then when Joshua would have said, my son, you've taken to this thing. I know you have. If, if Aiken probably knew what was going to happen to him, he, he, he probably lied. I, I don't know that. I, I would have. But I figured, well, it's done. It's... Uh, yeah, because I know what's going to happen to me, so I can't listen. <laughs> I know. Don't judge me, man. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm just telling you I would be struggling with this whole bit, you know. Um, but... It, anyway, you look at it, he's held it, he's held it to himself, right? And so give glory to God of Israel, give praise to him and tell me now what you've done, do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, he finally does it. Truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. So he finally, finally confesses. And then in verse um uh, 21 or 19, 21, he says, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them 
and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now, Joshua, now that I've told you all of these things, please have mercy on me and let me go. No, it doesn't say that. Because he knows he's done. He's caught. Verse 22 through 26, the next part of your outline is, well, let me, let me I, I made some notes here, just a couple little quick lessons, if you will, as we're dealing with Achan here. Confession without repentance, because we really don't see repentance, or a genuine change of mind is hollow. I've been caught. Think about that. Think about, there's a difference between feeling guilty for your sin and having remorse, right? Because guilty is like, I've been caught, I feel bad about it. True remorse, right? This repentant heart is, is, is a result of like agreeing and going, I'm wrong, you're right, I changed my mind about all of this. This is, this, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a different level. So he doesn't show any of that. He just, yeah, this is what happened. I coveted it, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes confession, though, is also too late to stop the discipline itself. In other words, God, of course, may still have mercy, but he's also just. And sometimes confession can be too late for the consequences. Who can think very quickly of a king who was repentant, truly repentant, and confessing, but God still gave the consequences? David. He spent all his time just crying out to God for his sin to save this child. And God restored David, but there were still baggage and consequences, and the child still died. And then afterwards, when they came to him, they said, the child is dead. What did, what did David do? He got up and he just said, you know what? I'm going to eat and God's will be done. And that's the type of hearts that we should have. Even though when we confess something, God is not obligated to still not allow there to be consequences, but he still loves us. And we should put our big boy and big girl pants on Wow, in today's vernacular, I don't know if I should even say that. Um, but, sorry. Um, but we'll edit that part out. Um, and, and um, but you, you put those, you're, you, you just have to just say God's will be done. You know, he's sovereign. And, and so, a little key learning there. So, verses 23 through 26, the death of Achan is discharged. Let's look, um, verse 22 through 26. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. Notice they ran. Even every word is so precious. It's not like they just kind of mosey on over. They want to get this thing done, all right? They ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent. And they brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down where? Before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and his donkeys and his sheep and his tent. And all that he had, it's like having bed bugs, get rid of it all. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and they stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones. That remains to this day, at least when this book was written. Then the Lord, then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley 
of Acor, or literally means trouble. I want us to think a little bit here before we move on to chapter eight. What are some things that you observe in these verses? I think it gives us a really good understanding of our God. First of all, none of this course caught God up by surprise. It shows the sovereignty and the foreknowledge of God, and it also shows the responsibility of man. And God in his sovereign wisdom is loves these people. And he, in his discipline and in his holiness, he's making the point again, because the problem with the pre previous generation that died off, that was not able to go into the land was for this kind of stuff. They were complaining, they were disobedient, they were whiners, blah, 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 blah. That's part of it. I also see, it's interesting, if you notice what else was burned with Achan and his family and all of his belongings? Well, his animals, the stolen goods. That was originally for who? That was originally for God. God's going, I don't need it. You're, you're, you're missing the point, right? Is what he's telling him. In other words, this was something that was set aside for God, gave those instructions, ache and disobeyed, and, and now it's been defiled. And God says, burn that with them. And you can imagine, that's a lot of loot, all right? That's a lot of loot. And, you, and, and, and of course, even Achan himself admitted, you know, I, I coveted them. Could you imagine the thoughts that ran through some people's minds? Because when you burn metal, does it completely go away? No, there would have been molten gold and silver and whatever, all this different stuff there. Do you think it even crossed the minds of someone to possibly maybe go out at night and dig that up? It probably did, but it probably lasted about a millisecond. Why? Because God made his point, right? God's like, sure, help yourself if you want to give that a try. You know, there is, there is, a, there is a value in discipline, amen? There is... It's not for our bad, it's for our good. It just means to teach. And so, yes, sir. There's quite a difference here between how God deals with a weak person and how God Yes. Indeed. There is. And there's lessons though from both, right? So it's 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 uh it is it is um uh he still loves the nation, but there's always still even just a remnant even of that nation. So you're right, Paul. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I, I was going to mention this section has always struck me this, uh, this idea of relationship with God and the people that are in this Amen, brother. That's that's a good, good point. And, you know, I again, we, when we started this study, we see the lessons that we get from this to apply to our lives. That's mentioned in the New Testament, that these things are given for our example. We see the reality of a God. And we've also pointed out, is the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament? No. He is, I love that word immutable. He is immutable. He's un changing and so 
uh, we, we found out here uh, about his holiness. Now, here's, here's a thought about the death of Achan here that we can gnaw on, and then we'll move into chapter 8. We should note that though Achan did, did confess his sin, he only did so when he was found out and forced to, right? Had he voluntarily cast himself on the mercy of God, as I've already said, his life might have been spared. A key issue that must not be forgotten is the trouble, though, that this brought on others. The natural man wants to believe that my sin does not hurt anybody. That's between me and my God or me and my whatever I put my faith into. It's, it's my, my dealings. Sin affects everybody in some form or fashion. And so this trouble brought trouble to others. Even the place was called trouble. And God took severe action because of the serious consequences of Achan's sin on others. The memorial of stones in the valley called Achor addresses this fact. It's another reminder. As I said, God says, don't, don't mess with me. I'm holy. So now we go to number 10 on your outline. Even though we're going into another uh, chapter, the flow still flows out of our Roman numeral, which, oh, by the way, I shoot, I forgot to put my PowerPoint up, but you guys hopefully are all getting it here. Um, the, the, the high level, if you will, is... Uh, we're still all the way through the end of chapter 8, still in Roman numeral 2, letter A, which is Jericho and the central campaign. All of this here is dealing with Jericho uh, and AI, that's central campaign. All right. So number 10 is the call to battle. The call to battle. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Let's read there. First of all, in... Well, let's read it. It says, and the Lord said to Joshua, so it's all done now. God's like, all right, I'm pacified. The wrath is gone for now. He goes right back into the verbiage that he had with Joshua and he had with Moses. And he says, do not fear and do not be dismayed. In other words, don't be discouraged. This is done now. It's behind us. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people. His city is in his hand and his land. And you shall do to Ai as its king and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock shall you take as a plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. Before we break this down, a little, little thoughts here. First of all, in that very first part of verse 1a, God is comforting Jer uh, Joshua. It's like, all right, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's interesting. Even though it, it affected everybody, God is not holding Joshua accountable for this. But Joshua was the leader, and he is the one that needs to take the lead that God has done it to solve it. So this, this problem is solved now, and, 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 and God just comforts and uh, 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 Jer uh, <laughs> Joshua there right out of the gate. And with the sin of Achan judge, God's favor towards the nation was restored. The next thing that we reread concerns God's New revelation to Joshua to both encourage him and give him directions for victory. So, in we see directions from the Lord uh, in 1b to 2. Let's read there specifically. So, the second part of, of, of 1 is um, I have given in your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves, lay an ambush against the city behind it. With God's blessing assured now, with these words of comfort, 
Here's some very, very specific instructions that were given. You don't need to write these down, but I've kind of bullet pointed them, but if you want to, that's fine. First of all, you notice God's basically tell him, don't make the same mistake twice. All right. You know, this is very clear. I want you to do to the king here what you did to the king of Jericho. God's word to Joshua was to use. What have you noticed here? When they went to Ai, who did they take? Not to Ai. Oh, originally? Right. Just a few. You'll notice here, God says this time, I want you to take, not, God didn't tell them to take a few. They took God for granted. They go, ah, you gave us Jericho? We don't need to pray about this. Let's just go on in there. Let's just take a few. So don't, don't make that mistake. He says, now I'm going to give you some instructions. I want you to take all of them. The fighting men of Israel. Though the primary cause of the defeat of Ai was Achan's sin, a secondary cause was underestimating the enemy, right? Sometimes we may think the enemy's small, but they can still be mighty. And then also overestimating themselves and obviously presuming on the Lord. So they're now told to take all these fighting men to go forth and trusting in God for him to do it, to give them the victory. Before, when they went to Ai with just a few, who were they, where were, who were they putting their trust in? Themselves, right? Got this done. Just still there, yes. All right. Secondly, is to now to turn this place of defeat into a place of victory. Notice what happens here. Joshua is told to go up again and attack Ai. He's to, re to return to the place. Here, some good spiritual lessons here. He's to go to the place of defeat. Sometimes we're fearful to go to those places, but sometimes God wants us to. And now because Joshua and the people are rightly related to the Lord, God promised that they could, could turn the place of defeat into a place of victory. Third, the basis of victory is always the same. The words, just as with Jericho, reminds us that victory at Ai, which is getting ready to come, would not only be as complete as that of Jericho, but as is with Jericho, it would come by the power of God, regardless of the strategy that was going to be used. God's here is getting ready to give them this strategy, which is totally different than he did. Because, well, by the way, we know AI had a wall around. Well, if the first time you got your horns in your box and you walked around and shouted, you'd like to think that that's how God would have you do it again. No, not this time. Because the basis is based on God and obedience to him, no matter what he tells us. So, fourthly, the spoils of victory are promised. Here's the irony of God's blessings. What did you notice in these verses that we just read in verse 2 about what they're supposed to do with the spoils? Exactly. Doug said if Achan could have just hung in there for one more battle, he would have been able to do it. Oh, is there a lesson there? So in, in verse 2, Joshua was told that the spoils of Ai and its livestock could now be taken by Israel as the first fruits of the land. This would have been the first time that they would have been able to have that stuff as they went into the land. Jericho had been placed under the ban but this was not the case with Ai. And it's ironic. Achan's dissatisfaction by patience with the Lord and trust in him actually caused him to miss, as Doug just said, precisely what he longed for and even much more. It's very possible he would have been able to even have more. And I, I put in big, bold letters to myself, waiting on the Lord and his timing along with obedience, always is better than being presumptuous on the Lord. Number five, as we saw the latter part of verse two, there's a change in strategies. The strategy used with AI differently, differed entirely from what was done at Jericho. So we even need to be prepared for that in our lives. Again, just spiritual lesson there that God is not obligated for him to work exactly as he's always worked in our specific lives along the way. Number 11, 
the strategy for the battle. Verses 3 through 13, the strategy for the battle. The strategy for the capture of AI was really very clever. It was ingenious, really, if you think about it. It, it, it involved placing an ambush behind, which was west of the city. And God himself told Joshua to do this. this. This wasn't something that Joshua would have come up with. He could have, but God says, this is what I want you to do. Chances are he wouldn't have. The outworking of this plan involved three detachments of soldiers. The first was a group of, of kind of commando type warriors who were sent by night to hide on the west side of the city. They're the, the ambushers. And their mission was to rush into AI and burn it after its defenders had deserted it to pursue Joshua and his army as they had previously done. Think about the ingenious that is. In other words, before they chased him out, we're getting ready to see, they go, ha, ah, he's stupid Israelites. Let's go chasing them out again. This time they all went, the whole city, all the men of war, right, went out. So let's look here in verses three through nine. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000, 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. Now, if you imagine if you just stopped right there, they're probably going, no, we're, we're not going to do that again. We're gonna run from them. Verse six, and they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say they are fleeing from us just as before. So we will flee before them. Then, now speaking to the ambushers, you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city for the Lord your God and give it into, or give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. Um, so Joshua sent them out and they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. I'll stop there just a moment. Yeah. So we see here what's, what's happening here. He's setting up, which by the way, um, there, how many here has uh, either been involved or know people or know about uh, military academies? You know, specifically, you've got the Air Force Academy, you have West Point, you have all these, these great places to where they train their officers and they train them in warfare. A lot of the tactics that are taught come right out of the Word of God, things that they have tried and it works. So think about that. You know, you have this thing where people are going to, all right, we chased them before because there's a certain level of of human emotion. It's like, oh, we chased them out before they ran. Let's do it again. So you know that. And that strategy, you say, okay, well, it's probably going to work. Pulls people out of the city. You have an ambush that comes in. By the time they look back, as we're getting ready to see, it's too late. So just, just an interesting thing on, on the wisdom of God. Specifically, um, uh, which by the way, these 30,000 men, the, the region up there has lots of large rocks in the region, and it made it possible for all these men to hide. So that, cause that's a lot of people. Verses 10 through 11, let's look here. Joshua arose early in the morning and mustered, which by the way, uh, if you'll notice what Joshua did, here is this great leader and he's spending time with the people. He's not in his little tent as we see in verse nine. He's there with them. Number 10 or, or verse 10. Joshua arose early in the morning. He does that a lot and mustered the people I'm not going to make a joke there. And and went up. <laughs> Whenever I see mustard, I always think of Frenchies. All right. Joshua's rose early in the morning and mustard or grape upon. 
or Joshua, sorry, Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. Joshua was with him. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai with a ravine between them and Ai. So this second contingent was the main army, which walked about 15 miles from where they were to Gilgal early the next morning. They camped in plain view on the side of Ai that they would see them. Led by Joshua, this army was diversionary. That was the plan to decoy the defenders of Ai out of the city. Look here in verse 12. It says, He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So this third contingent was another ambush, numbering 5,000, who were now positioned between Bethel and Ai to cut off the possibility of reinforcements from Bethel to aid the men of Ai. So it's a very wise, strategic thing, thinking through all of this. Think about what they did the first time, all right? And they failed. Number 12 on your outline, verses 14 through 29, the description of the battle. Here we're going to see specifically what went on. The the plan that we're getting ready to see worked exactly as planned. When the king of Ai saw Israel's army, he took the bait, pursued the Israelites who pretended to retreat in fear as they had gone, as, as they had done before. And as we know what's happening, that left the city totally unguarded. At the Lord's command, Joshua stretched out the javelin in his hand. And with the signal, the troops hidden in ambush on the west side ran to the city, set it on fire. This left the men of Ai surrounded with no place to flee. For now Joshua and his men with the 5,000 also hidden in ambush all turned to fight the men of Ai, but they were caught. It was well too late for them. Look here in verses 14 through 22. And as soon, uh, as soon as the king of Ai saw this and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the uh, Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush among against him behind the city. And Joshua and all the Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. I, I can't help but just to think what that maybe looked like. My silly mind goes, it's like they knew they, they, knew they were going to win at this time because they were doing it God's way. I mean, were they screaming like little girls? You know, you know. So, so they pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were, who were in the city were called together to pursue them. So they're sucking all the people out of the, out of the city, right? Uh, and as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel uh, who did not go out after Israel. And they left the city open and pursued Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that's in your hand towards Ai. He didn't have a, he didn't have a, a rod like, like Moses did. And I will stretch it into your hand, and I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin. It was in his hand towards the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they went and hurried and set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, could you imagine what was running through their mind? Behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven. This is not in here, but I guarantee you the words were rut row. <laughs> and they had no power to flee this way or that. For the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city, and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai, and the others came out from the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. Crazy, right? And in verses 23 through 29, we'll see here, after 
killing of all of AI soldiers, Israel's army re-entered re the city and killed all its inhabitants. Now, if you were here last week, and I hope you were, you can go back and look on our, our YouTube channel, uh, Liberty Baptist Church of Claremont, and look for the lesson from last week. We talked, spent some time about the, uh, the, the, the biblical understanding of why God would have destroyed these people. And so we don't have time to go through all that again, but it was righteous and it was just to be able to do that. So after killing them, they went back. The dead soldiers and the citizens told of 12,000. Plunder was taken from the city, as God said that they could do. And we see here that it was made a, reap of ruin, a heap of ruins. Look here, starting verse 23. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all of the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword. All Israel returned to Ai, struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. It makes you wonder there why they brought the king. Did they want just Joshua to kill him? Did they want to like, hey, maybe we can hang on to him and get, to, who knows? But Joshua was like, I'm not going to have any of this. Notice what he does. Only the livestock was what they were allowed this time. And the spoil of the city Israel took as their plunder, according to the word of the Lord that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening and at sunset joshua commanded that they took take his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised it over as a great heap of stones which stands there to this day so i'm sorry verse 23 says but they brought. yeah it's almost implying that like why would you do that you shouldn't have done that but joshua was like i'm not going to mess with god so one quick thing here, and we'll be able to get through chapter eight tonight because we're, we're almost wrapping up here. Um, well, maybe I still have six pages. Um, the, you'll notice here what they did to the king's body. Um, they, hang, they hung him on a tree. Why didn't they just leave him here? You guys weren't listening to my message, were you? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when Jesus was on the cross. I want you, if you will, please to turn to Deuteronomy. Actually, you know, you don't need to turn. I'll read it for you. I'll help you. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22, 23 says, this was the law of God. If a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to the death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. And that same thing was the reason why the religious leaders wanted Jesus' body also off of the tree, the cross. So, Israel now having been restored to God's favor, favor, became victorious over this city. And out of their original failure came not only a second chance, but a great victory with a lot of lessons. Number 13 on your outline, the pilgrimage after the battle. The pilgrimage after the battle, verses 30 through 35. And this wraps up this chapter. Specifically in verse 30 and 31, after the victory at Ai, Joshua did what, what seemed to be foolishly, humanly, and militarily speaking. Why would you do this? Look here now in verse 30 and 31. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded that the people 
of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. So it would you, you would like to think that immediately um, they would pursue the military campaign and just move quickly. They're on a they're on a roll now, right? It's like let's go ahead now. We're, we're obeying God. Let's just take the next thing. Here we have again where where Joshua is following the, the Lord's command. He's going stop and let's let's make this pilgrimage to this mountain because we were instructed to do so. Um, if you will turn to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 27 very quickly. Just back just briefly, a little bit there in your Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 27. And very quickly, I'll read verses one through eight. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep the whole command that I command you today. And on the day that you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. You shall offer burnt offerings on it the, to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stones all the words of the law very plainly. So those were those instructions that were given. They needed to get that taken care of. And it's a pilgrimage. They needed to go to this, to this place, which was a good little hike, but it wasn't, there wasn't anything in the way. If you look on the map on where they were going. So he leads the entire nation and the cattle and everything um, from their camp at Gilgal, because they went back there northward up the Jordan Valley to a place specified by Moses, um, the mountains of Ebal and Gerizim, which are at Shechem. This was a march of about 30 miles, um, but evidently there was no problems along the way. Question is, is, why was this location chosen? Well, if you look on the map, the, these mountains are located in the geographic center of the land, and from either peak, much of the promised land can be seen. So that was part of it. God had this very specific place to where they could see the promised land as central as possible and get a good, good view of it. It also had outstanding um, acoustical properties. And one person standing on one mountain can be easily heard by someone standing on the other mountain. And I immediately had a thought of Ricola. <laughs> For those of you who all know what I'm talking about, it's our little secret. The ceremonies involve three things. Um, and we just read them. I'm not going to go through all of them because I have a lot of notes on them. The bottom line is, is that, you know, you see the very specific things that God wanted to do. And if you'll note, it says that they were to, to, to write the law exactly on these in these plastered sections. So I want you. I want you to be Bereans. Go and just pull up these these things. If you want to, you can you can even use the resource um, of uh, of right now media. There's uh, a couple of things on Joshua. I think on there that might help you. Uh, it's very very good. Um, but God, Joshua said, I'm going to get this taken care of. We were given instruction by Moses. We were given instruction by God, and we're going to get this thing taken care of before we do anything else. God's stuff first, right? And then, um, starting in verse 30, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, and we'll, we'll wrap up here. And at that time, Joshua uh, built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, 
as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut. Did I already read that? Oh, I read it in Deuteronomy. All right. I was going to say, getting redundant. I'm getting redundant. I'm getting redundant. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, blah, 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 and they offered a burnt offering to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings, verse 32. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stone the copy of the law of Moses, which he had written, and all Israel, sojourner as well as native born. So there was people along, keep in mind, there was people along with the children of Israel who were sojourners. They were not, they were not Israelites. They were God fearers, right? And sojourner as well as native born and their elders and officers and their judges stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. Remember, there's acoustics here. They can hear all this. And the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Awesome. You, when you, when you, you see the word, does, 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 the, does Mount Gerizim and Ebal, specifically Gerizim, even ring a, a note or bell in your head? Tell us, Paul. You're, you're, you're right there. So Jesus was going through the land of what? Right? So what, there was the woman at the well, and she was where? She was a Samaritan. And, and, she, and there was just all this discussion about worshiping uh, at Mount Gerizim. And you guys say here, blah, blah, blah. That all started right here. God had never told them to set that up as a permanent place after Jerusalem. So very good. All right. So there you go. We made it through chapter eight. Lord willing, if he chooses to tarry, and I hope he doesn't, I hope he comes. But in the meantime, we'll hit chapter nine and 10 next week. Um, and let's close in prayer. It's right at 801. I love you all. Thank you. Uh, and let's pray. You know, Paul, would you please nice and loud so the people on here can hear you? Uh, just close this in prayer. Amen. Thank you all. I love you. God bless you. Hello, beautiful people. You have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you Sunday, Lord willing.